Hilchais Ishus Perek Asiri, the laws of marriage, chapter 10. And we are moving today to a new step in the laws of marriage. On the screen we see the two stages of a halachic marriage. The first is called Kiddushin, or Erusin, the act of acquisition. And that's where the man gives the woman he intends to marry some money, an object of value, a document that says, you are consecrated to me. And the halachic ramification of that is that now she can no longer be with anybody else. You still don't have the rights to be with her intimately, but, uh, but she's yours. To the point that if you want to dissolve the kiddushin, you actually have to give a divorce. That's how binding it is. So it's really not like an engagement today. An engagement today is just a formal verbal agreement. It's not any, uh, it doesn't have any legal status. But the Kiddushin, in times of old, that was the first stage of actual marriage. The second stage, what we call full marriage, is called Nisuin in Halacha, and it's also called Chuppah. And Chuppah, when I say Chuppah, we think of a canopy, like the wedding canopy on the, on the picture, although it's not entirely accurate according to the Rambam. According to the Rambam, Chuppah takes place when you bring your wife into a private room, what we call today the Cheder Yichud, after the Chuppah, the, the groom and bride go off into a private room, that's, according to the Rambam, when Nisuin takes place. There are many, many opinions as to when, when, when Nisuin happens. Some say it's when the husband covers the bride's face. Some say it's when he takes her under the canopy. Some say it's when he takes her into a private room. Today, we do them all. We do all the stages to fulfill all the opinions, but today we're learning Rambam. The Rambam's opinion is Yichud. You have to actually go into a room secluded with her where there's potential to have relations, even if you don't actually have relations, but you have to be in the Yichud room. And then the marriage is completed on a halachic level. We, we, we do it all. We do it all. And by the way, today we do Kiddushin. We do even the first stage of the marriage. We do under the chuppah. That's when the husband gives the wife a ring. That's Kiddushin. But we do it much later in the game. We have them get engaged, verbal agreement, set up the wedding, the whole thing. They come to the chuppah, then we do kiddushin. And that's why we take a break between the kiddushin and making the, the wedding blessings to show that it's two different acts. You gave the ring, first stage. Then the custom today in most chuppahs is to read the ketubah. That's when we read the marriage contract. And then we go into the, the actual marriage. But it's important to know that it's actually two separate stages. Kiddushin nisuin. Ramam's first nine chapters in these laws was spent on kiddushin. And it was quite extreme sometimes. We went into all kinds of cases. You can make different kinds of Kiddushin, but it was all about Kiddushin. It was all about the first stage of consecration. Now that the Ramam has concluded all the laws relating to consecration, we move on to the next stage, Nisuin. And actually today, we're more talking about the preparations for Nisuin. Specifically, the preparation known as the Ketubah, writing up the marriage contract. And secondly, the preparation which primarily existed in times of old where it was required to give a woman time to prepare for the wedding in terms of jewelry and clothing. And we're going to see, depending on the type of woman she was, either she would require 30 days or actually a full year. That's where we're off to today. But first, the Ramam introduces the concept of Nisuin, the concept of the second stage of marriage. Says the Ramam halacha alef ha'arusa, when a woman is formally consecrated, asura lebaila medivrei seifrim, she is still forbidden to her husband, rabbinically, so long as she is still in her father's home. So strict is the law that if you have relations with your consecrated wife, even though you already gave her Kiddushin, you already made her yours in a way, but you're having relations with her in her father's house, the house of your father-in-law, the sages have the right to, la to, to give you lashes, rabbinic lashes. Even if you had initially consecrated her through relations, one of the three methods of consecration is money, a document, or, or actual relations. So even if you already had relations once as the consecration, a second round of relations is forbidden while she's in her father's house, Add until you do what's called nisuin, the final stage. You bring her into your home, and you unite with her, and by that, by that you specifically designate her for yourself. This seclusion is called in halacha going into the chuppah. Again, not so much the marriage canopy, as much as it is taking her into your own space. And that's what's called nisuin, full marriage, in all places in halacha. There are many opinions as to what nisuin is. The reason the Rambam chooses this one 
is because if you remember from chapter 1, the Rambam is of the opinion that in actual marriage, in terms of the actual marriage, nothing changed before the giving of the Torah and after. The only new thing introduced by the giving of the Torah was the, the uh, obligation to do acquisition, to do Kiddushin. But the Nisuin stayed as it always was. What was it always? It was always a husband and wife living together as husband and wife. So Jewish Nisuin also has to be at least setting the stage for that even if not actually having relations together, but at least going into a secluded room where that could happen, where you could live together as husband and wife. If indeed you have relations with your betrothed wife, with intent for Nisuin, you tell your wife, look, I want to effectuate the full marriage right now, let's have relations. After you've already consecrated her, the moment you do what's called Ha'ara'a, Ha'ara'a, is going to be defined in the fifth book of the Ramam. It's the initial act, consummating relations. Part of the organ penetrates the woman. So at that, mo- at that moment, he requires her. She becomes a fully married woman. And she is considered to be his wife for every matter. So you didn't follow the proper protocol, but at least you did it with the intent for marriage, so the marriage begins. The moment a betrothed woman enters into seclusion, the chupa, the Rambam's chupa, secluded room with the husband. Now, there, there, it's, it's a free for all. The man can have relations with the woman whenever he wants. She is his complete wife for all matters. The moment a woman enters the chupa, she's called married. Even if she did not actually have relations. Fascinating. They went into the room. No matter what happens, the moment they're in that room, she's married. But the Rambam holds, she has to be fitting to have had relations. For example, Avalim Nida, if she was in her on her period, even if he took her into the chupa, they, w- they went into seclusion. According to the Rambam, a woman who gets married in a state of, of menstrual impurity, the marriage doesn't, fu- excuse me, fully take place. And she is still like an engaged woman, a betrothed woman. Today we don't follow this. We, we, we make every effort to schedule a wedding around a woman's time that, it shouldn't be, that she, she should be pure. But if she isn't, and it happens a lot because of anxiety and stress, different things could happen, we still do the wedding properly. And we don't rule like the Rambam. We say the marriage is binding, except, of course, they cannot be together. They cannot have relations. But still, the marriage is, is full. Before the full marriage goes into effect, we're supposed to make the blessing of the grooms in the home of the groom. They used to get married in their home, so that's why we say the home and the groom. Today we do a wedding in a hall, we do the blessings at the wedding. There are six blessings on the wedding. Today we know that there are seven, because one of them is the blessing on the wine, as we'll see in a minute. But there are six blessings exclusive to the wedding. The Elohim, they are the following, and these are the ones on the screen. First of all, blessed are you, Hashem, Lord our God, King of the universe, that has created everything for His honor. This is like a general blessing about the wedding. Thank everyone for coming, etc. Blessed are you, Hashem, King of the universe, who created man. That's a blessing in general on the fact that the human being exists. And now, a blessing on the actual marriage. Blessed are you, Hashem, King of the universe, who has formed man in his image, in an image reflecting his own likeness, and from the man, Hashem created an everlasting edifice. That's the woman. Hashem created woman from the man, who allows the man to reproduce, and therefore have eternity. Creator of man. Fourth blessing. The barren woman, that's Jerusalem, should rejoice and be happy as all of her children will gather back to her in joy. Blessing from Mashiach. Blessed are you God who will cause Zion to be happy with its children. In other words, even as we celebrate a wedding, we wish for Mashiach. And then a blessing for the married couple. We tell Hashem, allow these beloved friends to rejoice as you rejoiced with your creation in Gan Eden in the beginning. You created Adam and Eve. You made them a married couple before they, they did the sin. They were very happy. Make this couple as happy as them. Blessed are you, Hashem, who makes groom and bride rejoice. 
And the final blessing, Baruch Atah Hashem, Malekinu Melech HaYilam. Thank you, Basra Yu Hashem, King of the Universe, Asher Bara, Sasin, Mesimcha, Chasan, Vechala, Gila, Rina, Ditsa, Vechedva, Ava, Achva, Shalim, Vereus. Hashem, you created happiness and gladness, the groom and the bride, rejoicing, delight, cheer, song, love, brotherhood, peace, friendship. Meheira Hashem, Malekinu Yishama, Ba'are Yehuda, Vechutz Yisiru Shalayim. Very soon, Hashem, it should be heard in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Kel Sasen, Kel Simcha, Kel Chasen, Kel Kala, may we hear the sound of rejoicing, the sound of happiness, the sound of the groom, the sound of the bride. Kel Mitzhaleis Chasonim Mechupasam, Unu Arim Mimishte Neginasam, the voice of grooms rejoicing from their wedding canopies and youths from their song feasts. Baruch Ata Hashem, Mesameach Chasonim Makala, Blessed are you Hashem, who makes the groom happy with his bride. Those are the six wedding blessings. If there's also wine there, maybe you should bring a cup of wine, as is the custom today. This is a picture of the Rebbe himself uh, leading a marriage. And you can see, he's holding a cup of wine in his right hand, and you begin with a blessing on the wine. You make a blessing on the wine first. And then you continue the order of all the blessings while still holding the cup. So it turns out, so you're making a total of seven blessings, which is why we call this today Sheva Brachot. You hear people get married, making a Sheva Brachas. Sheva Brachas means seven blessings. The Yesh Mekaymah, there are some places until today, in many Sephardic communities, they follow this custom. Shana Havi Hadas Im Hayayin. They bring a, 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 a myrtle branch, a Hadas, with the wine. O Mevarech Ala Hadas Achar Hayayin, Ta Achar Kach Mevarech Hashesh. You make a blessing on the myrtle branch, after you make a blessing on the wine, and then you make the six blessings for a total of actually Eight blessings. These blessings, the blessings on the, of the groom, can only be recited if you have a minion, essentially. Ten adult males who are free. The chasan min minion, in other words, not slaves. The chasan min minion, the groom himself, can count for part of the minion. says that I'm a so now we have two elements that create nisuin. The actual seclusion and the blessings. Can you have one without the other? Says the Ramam Hamaare says Saisha Uberach Birkas Chasanim Valay Nisyachidima Bebesai. A person betrothes a woman, makes the blessings, but didn't do the seclusion act. Blessings count for nothing. Adayin Arusahi, she is still only consecrated. Sheein Birkas Chasanim Oisa Hanisuin Ella Knisa Lechupa. Because it isn't the blessings that make the marriage, it's the actual taking in to the chupa, which in the Ramam's eyes means seclusion. Eiras Vakanas Lechupa. On the other hand, if a person would betroth a woman, give her a ring, take her into a chupa, into a secluded room, without making the blessings, she is a completely married woman, and let him make the blessings later, even after a couple of days. As a matter of fact, the Ramam says there are some times when we purposely delay the blessings. For example, if a woman is a nida, if she's menstruating. According to the Rambam, a nida initially should not even get married. Go into the full stage of marriage till she's purified. The aim mevarchim la birkas chasanim achetitar, and we don't make the blessing shava brachot until she becomes purified. According to the Rambam, again today we don't do this. Today the wedding goes ahead, but according to the Rambam, if you found out the woman was in nida on the day the wedding was arrived, you got to push off the wedding. It's only that if he transgressed and married and made the blessings, you don't have to do it again. If she's married, but ideally for a nida, you don't get married on the spot. And now that we've talked about the general idea of what makes Nisuin, the seclusion and the blessings, the Rambam goes a little bit backwards to describe something which is required in order to allow Nisuin to happen, and that is what's known as the Ketubah. The Ketubah today we know is this fancy document, where uh, it's full of Aramaic words, no one really knows what it says, but it's actually a contractual obligation where the husband commits to providing for his wife, and specifically delineated in the Ketubah is the amount of money that the husband will pay in case of divorce. And we're going to soon see that the whole ketubah was initially made to avoid divorce. A husband who would know that he has to give out so much money would, would, would be more hesitant to end the relationship if, uh, if he knew it's going to cost him. And so the sages, according to the Ramam, it was the sages who instituted the idea of a ketubah um, in terms of a specific amount of money that he has to commit. And this, these laws of ketubah are going to occupy us now um, for, for a big portion of this chapter. Says A man must write a ksuba, a marriage contract, before going into seclusion, 
the Achar Kach Yeh Mutar Bi'ishteh, and only afterwards will he be allowed to engage in relations with his wife. The Chasan Noisin Zchara Soifer. It is the groom's obligation, and therefore he has to pay the scribe for writing it. The Kamahu Kaisiv Law. How much is in this contract? How much money must you promise the woman in case of divorce? Im Haisa Besula. If she was a virgin, Ein Kaisvin La Pachis Mimasayim Dinarim. No less than 200 dinar, 200 coins, can be promised. And we're talking about dinars of silver. The consensus is that a dinar of silver is about between 4.8 and 5.1 grams of silver. So it isn't that much when you think about it. If you calculate this into dollars, it's about $760, $770. Okay? But I guess in those days it was a big, a big amount of money. Vim Ba'ula, if the woman was not a virgin, Ein Kaisvin La Pachis Mimea Dinarim. Then you only you write her no less than a hundred dinar. Half of that. That's called the fundamental, the main part of the kisuba. Um, if you want to add, you want to promise more, you can add even a talent of gold. As a matter of fact, we do. In our ketubah, I'm just going to show you here, this is zoomed out. This is a ketubah of a regular virgin woman. And this is a ketubah of a non-virgin woman. And watch what happens when you zoom in. When you zoom in, this is the top one. The top was all, all Aramaic. But what does it say on top? I'm giving you Kesef Zuzei Matan. 200 Zuz. And then it says on the bottom, V'hosif Lam Mindilei. And the groom also adds. In today's ketubah, we always write a little addition. You give the Ikar, the fundamental $200, 200 dinar, plus more. This is, um, again, a... Ketubah of a non-virgin woman, what does it say here? Zuzei mea. I'm only giving you a hundred. The chazei lichi midrabanan, which is fitting to you on the rabbinic decree. But also at the end they say, v'hosifla min delay, that we've added some, uh, we've added some money. But you can see, this is, this is two actual ketubahs. Here we have two hundred, and here we only have a hundred. And then the hosif, you can add whatever you want. Now, if you choose to add to the ketubah, if you're a nice guy, and you want to commit more money, Says the Rambam, Vidina Taisvis, Vidina Ikar Echadul Reva Dvarim. The law governing the addition and the law governing the fundamental amount of money is pretty much the same for most things. In other words, in a case where you have to pay out, typically you have to pay out everything. There's rarely a time when you can divide and say, you know what, I'm only paying out the main, I'm not paying out the addition, or I'm only paying out the addition, I'm not paying out the main, as we will see, but mostly they're the same. Lefichach, therefore, Kol Makim Shanaymar by Ksuba Stam, wherever in these coming books we're going to be saying the word Ksuba, Marriage contract, we are referring to who ha'ikar v'hataisvis ke'echad. We're referring to the sum total of the fundamental 200 or 100 dollars plus the addition. It was the sages who enacted the ksuba for the woman. So it shouldn't be light in the eyes of the husband to just divorce her whenever he wants. No, he'll have to think twice because he knows it's going to cost him. Now, it says the Rambam, Dinarim elu tiknu the truth is that even though I said before that it was 200 dinar of silver, the dinars that you have to promise your wife don't have to be pure silver. It was the, it was the coin, or in other words, the, the standard is the coin that existed in the days when the sages enacted the kesuba. And in those days, says the Raman, we know, it was only seven-eighths copper and only one-eighth silver. It was a ratio of one to seven the actual silver in the coin. Ad sheyiyah b'sela chatzi zuz kesef, which means that a sela, which is four dinar, remember this slide? I don't know if it's from way back, the laws of Eruv, when the Raman was telling us about the initial times of weight in halacha, so he said that a mana is a hundred dinar, and a sela is four dinar. I just borrowed this slide from, from back there. It's a bit, bit primitive, but the point is, if you think about it, if every dinar is one-eighth silver, so if you have a sela, which is four dinar, there's a half of a dinar of silver, because a zuz and a dinar are interchangeable. So a sela, which is, right? Because one-eighth. Basically, whatever coins you have of silver, whatever silver coins you have, it's only one-eighth silver. The nimtza, masayin, dinarim shal basula, which means that in effect, the 200 dinar being promised to a virgin are actually only chamisha ve'esrin zuzin shal kesef tar, are only 25 pure silver coins. The hundred dollars, the hundred dinar being promised to a non-virgin woman are only twelve and a half zuzim, dinar of pure silver. 
Mishkal Kalzuz, Sheish Vetishim Sa'iris. The weight of every dinar is 96 barley corns. Kamesh Shabi Ayrnu Bitchilas Eruvin, as we explained in the beginning of the laws of Eruv. The Hadinar Hu Anikra Zuz Bechamakim, no, that the two terms, dinar and Zuz, are all interchangeable. They're, they're, they're the same name. Bein Sheyem in Akesaf Atar, Bein Sheyem in Matbea Eisan Ayamim, whether the coin that you're holding in your hand is pure silver or that time standard of one eighth silver, seven eighths copper, doesn't matter. Dinar and Zuz are the name for that individual coin. We would call this today, let's say, a penny. So a hundredth, because the mana was a, was a famous um, numerical currency. So a dinar was a hundredth of that. So every dinar was like a penny compared to the dollar, let's say. A little more than a penny because it was silver, but the point is, you understand what I'm saying. So bottom line is, that's the kisuba. And the Ramam repeats, Ein paychasin li mi masayim v'li mi We give no less than 200 dinar to a virgin, 100 to a non-virgin. V'chala paychez bi'ilase bi'ilaz nus. If you write in your contract any less than that, when you have relations, you're literally having promiscuous relations. It isn't Torah condoned relations. Echad ha'kesef 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 Now the truth is, you don't have to have a document. Because it's the same powerful if you write it down in a document. V'echad shehid olav edim v'kanu miyadeh shu chayav lamea yimasayim. And if you have witnesses, and they did a kinyan, they, you, you lifted up an object, and uh, you say, I'm obligated to my wife, 100 or 200, depending on her condition. If you have witnesses that watch that, that's okay. Hareza mutter, that's allowed. You don't have to actually have a written contract. Today we always do, but in those days, you see in the Talmud many times, there were certain places, everybody knew. In this city, they don't write ketubas, they only, they only promise it. Also, if a guy is like, you know what, look, I don't have the, I don't have the parchment, I, don't have the, I can't write it up, but here, Take a watch that's worth all that money. He gives her an object that would be worth her ketubah. Until you have the time to write it down. Of course, ideally you want to write it down. But if you didn't yet, it's okay if you gave her collateral, so to speak, in placement of the, of the uh, amount she'd be, she'd be um, entitled to. It says that I'm a malachayut. What happens if there is no ketubah? For whatever reason, a person consummates a marriage with a woman, and did not write a kasuba. Or you wrote a kasuba and then it got lost. My parents lost their kasuba. Yeah. A couple of months after they married, you have to write a new one. It's a whole complicated thing. Or the woman pardons the kasuba. She goes to her husband, you know what? I trust you so much. I don't care about the kasuba. You can have the money back. Or she sells it back to him. If you want to stay married, you must rewrite at least the fundamentals of the ksuba. In other words, the 200, 100. Let's say you had written $10,000, right? You were, you were so nice, $200 because my wife's a virgin, plus $10,000. And she pardons you that, you must rewrite at least the 200. Because it's biblically forbidden. A person cannot be with his wife for even a moment without a ksuba, a, a, a contract. But what if the woman needed cash and she sold off her kasuba to somebody else only for the possible benefit? People do this today with loans. You have an IOU note, someone owes you 100K, but you need cash. So what do you do? You sell off that note to somebody else for 90K, less than the face value. And then when it's time for the debt to be required, they make the 100K back, so they end up making more money. Same thing over here. The woman says, look, I need cash. My kisuba is worth 10K. I'll sell it to you for 7K. And in case of divorce, if the marriage indeed goes sour, you'll get all the money. So here, she didn't actually relinquish her kisuba. She just relinquished it in terms of the possible result. So then the Ramam says, No need to write another kisuba. Why? Because remember, what's the whole reason for the kisuba? The whole reason why we have a kisuba is so the husband should hesitate before he divorces, because he knows he doesn't have to pay it out. Here, he will still have to pay it out. Maybe not to her, but to, to, but to, the, to, the, to the buyer. If this man is going to divorce his wife, he would have to pay out the kisuba to the buyer, just like he would pay it out to her if she didn't sell it. So... He still has that threat of the money, and therefore it's okay to do so. A person betrothes a woman. He writes her a ksuba, and didn't take her into seclusion. Again, she's still only betrothed, not married. 
like with the blessings. Even though the blessings are a component of the marriage, they don't make the marriage. The ksuba writing doesn't make the marriage. And therefore, if at this point he has already consecrated her, he has already written her the contract, and then he dies, or he divorces her, before doing the full marriage, first of all, she can only collect the fundamental. 200, 100. And it has to be from properties that are free. In other words, properties in the husband's possession. Typically we say that once a husband marries a wife, all his properties under lien to the kasuba, and whatever he sells during the marriage can later be collected in case of divorce. But here, because they never consummated the marriage, she can only collect from free property, property that's still under his possession. The Eina Goiva Taisvis Klau, and the addition promised to her, she doesn't get at all. Since he never actually consummated the marriage. But on the flip side, if he would consecrate a woman with no contract, and she only dies, and he dies or divorces her with, with, um, in that state of being consecrated, she doesn't get anything because he never wrote the contract, even the fundamental 200 Because the woman only has rights to the fundamental money of the kasuba if she actually gets married or at least he writes the contract. But if there's no written contract and no marriage, there's no ksuba. And the Ramam repeats a law that we said earlier. The Hama'are says, Bite the Kasav Laksuba. If a father hands off his daughter in marriage and they write a Kasuba, Umeis a Gersha Kishahai Sanara, and the husband dies or divorces her while she's in, still in a state of Na'ara, the first six months after puberty, still under the jurisdiction of the father, Ksubasa Lehaviha, the money that's going to be paid out for the Kasuba belongs to the father. Kamesha Bi'arna Lamaila Beperak Shlishi, as we have explained already in chapter three. And that concludes the discussion on Kisuba. And now the Ramam discusses another element of full marriage. The Chayin Tikkun Chacham says the Ramam, the sages also enacted. So we have a couple of enactments. We have the enactment of the blessings. We have the enactment of the Kisuba. And now we have the enactment of what we call today Sheva Brachot. The seven days of feasting after a marriage. The sages enacted. Shekola Noise Besula. Anybody who marries a virgin woman, Yiyasameach Ima Shivas Yamim. Needs to rejoice with her for a full week. He cannot do his work. He cannot do business in the market. He eats and drinks and rejoices with her. No matter what his state was. He could be previously married, not previously married. If she's a virgin, she gets seven days. If she was a non-virgin woman, no less than three days. Not seven, but three. The sages made an enactment for Jewish girls. She is Samechim Abu Ullah Shlesha Yamin bin Bakr bin Almin that he should be happy with the non virgin wife for three days, again, whether she is whether he is previously unmarried or previously married. Says that Amalach Yud Gimu, Yeshle La Adam Lisa Nashim Rabis Kaachas Bien Echa, the person has the right to marry many women on one day, or Mevarich Birkas Khasanim Lukulan Kaachas and make the blessings for all of them together. Avalisimcha, but for joy, rejoicing, Tzarech Lismayachim Kol Achas Ve'achas Simcha Ra'uyala. You need to rejoice with each wife, her own set of rejoicing. In Besula Shiva, in Beula Shleisha, with the virgin seven days, non-virgin three days. Ve'ein Ma'arvin Simcha Ve'simcha. We do not mix one joy with the other. And we're going to see in a second that this actually comes from this week's parsha. So it's divine providence. Yudaled Muter La'aris Bechol Yim Choy La'filu B'Tishba Bein Bayayim Bein Balayla. Consecration, initializing a marriage, the first stage of a marriage can be done on any weekday, even on Tisha B'Av, by day or by night. Aval Nashim, but full marriage, full weddings, we do not do. Not on Friday and not on Sunday. Because we're worried that you might end up violating Shabbos in preparing the meal. The wedding's on Friday, you might go into Shabbos cooking and whatnot. Weddings on Sunday, you might cook too early. On Shabbos afternoon. Because we know that the grooms are always very busy with preparing the wedding meal. Needless to say, on Shabbat itself, you cannot do a marriage. Now today I should point out, we do do weddings both on Friday and on Sunday. Because we know how prep works and we're not worried about this anymore. But it used to be that it was a big deal to prepare a, mar- a wedding feast, so we, we didn't do it. Even on Cholam Oed, we do not marry women, as we explained. We do not mix one joy with the other. This we explained actually on, in the laws of Yom Tov, um, of, of Cholam Oed. We don't mix one rejoicing with the other. In other words, God, Cholam Oed is, is God's rejoicing. It's the holiday. And we don't bring our weddings into that. 
Shanemar, as it says, and here's the verse. Here's the verse from this week's parsha. What happened? Yaakov went to work for Lavan, and he wanted to have Rachel. And in the end, what happened? Lavan tricked him and gave him Leah. He wakes up in the morning, and he says, Oi, it's Leah, you tricked me. I want to marry Rachel. So what does Lavan say? Malay, shivu azois. Finish the week with this one. Venitna lecha agam azois. And then we'll give you the other one. How come? Give, her, give him Rachel right now. From here you see, you married Leah, you got to have a week with her. Then we'll give you Rachel. No mixing marriages, no mixing joys. But again, any other day, Monday to Thursday, you can marry whenever you want. Provided that you can spend three days working on the wedding meal before the wedding. It says that I'm something that we're going to really expand on in tomorrow's chapter. If you lived in a place where the court only went into session on Mondays and Thursdays, then a virgin woman should only get married on Wednesdays. This way, if a husband had ta'anat betuli, and this is called, this is going to be tomorrow's entire topic, a claim that a woman is not a virgin. Again, you, for a virgin woman, promise her 200 dinar. You commit to a large amount of money. If you discover that she isn't a virgin, then there's a mistaken transaction there, and you will take her to court. Since, ideally, the, frame, the time frame for that is only one day, so we say, get married on Wednesday night, so you can engage in relations that night, and the next morning, if you have a claim, you'll bring her to court. Now, why not on Sunday? If they're in session on Monday, get married on Sunday, but we said before that you don't get married on Sunday. So, therefore, a virgin wedding date was always on Wednesday. The sage is also enacted. That if you're marrying a non-virgin woman, you should initially marry her on Thursday, so that you can rejoice with her three days, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat, and begin the new week going to work. Go out to work on Sunday, because unlike in America, where Sunday is part of the weekend, in other parts of this world, Sunday is part of the new week. So, huh? In Israel, yeah, Israel, they, they, they work on Sunday's a regular day. No, no, I'm saying there's no difference with the... Oh, oh, the dates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. Today, we're, we're not particular. Today, we, because we don't have the court and we don't have the whole thing of claiming about virginity. So we just, uh, we, as the Rebbe used to say about other things, our problem becomes our solution. In other words, because we don't have the courts, we don't have anything, so we can get married whenever we want. Halacha tezayin. Hama'ares has bite kitana. The final subject in this chapter is about preparation for the wedding. A person who betrothes, a father who hands off his daughter when she's a child, and the husband says, okay, let's get married. We did the Kiddushin, now let's do the full marriage. Both her and the father can, can hold back and stop. That we should wait for the actual wedding till she becomes physically mature. But if he desires to consummate the marriage, he can consummate it. The question is, who's he? Either the husband or the father? Some texts have Ratsu. If they want, if both agree, the point is that ideally they can, they can withhold the marriage from taking place, but if they want to, they can get it started. It's still not proper to do that, but, uh, but you could. What if you consecrated a woman, and you waited a few years? Again, between the first stage and second stage of marriage, a lot of time could elapse. Today we do it all under the chuppah, but it could happen that a lot of time, a lot of time would pass. So you, you gave her a ring one year, you waited a couple of years, and boom, you want the wedding to get started, she's already physically mature. If she is a na'ara, that's in the stage of those six months between first showing signs of physical puberty and becoming a major, the moment from the day he demands the wedding to happen, we give her a full 12 months to prepare, to begin to support herself, fix whatever she needs, and then she gets married. But if he demands her to the marriage, after she already becomes a major, we go back and we say 12 months begin from the day that her na'ara stage ended, the day the six months ended. Same thing if he originally consecrated her on the day she became a major. We give her 12, day, 12 months from that day of the consecration, the day she became a major. 
Kidsha, Achar Shabagra, what if he initially consecrated her only after she became major? Im Avru, Allah Hashne Masar Chedesh Bebagrusa, if she's already 12 months into her being a Bogaret, Ola Achar Kachni Skach, and only afterwards she was consecrated, Ain Noisnin La Elash Leishim Yemi Ematviya. At this point, she's already a major. She's more or less prepared to get married, and therefore she only needs 30 days from the day of the demand to get married. Similarly, if somebody initially consecrates a woman who is non-virgin, and the commentary say means a widow from a previous marriage, we only give her 30 days from the day that you demand the wedding to happen because she's already prepared from her original marriage. Says that Say the same way we provide a woman with time, the moment the husband was demand, demanded her to prepare herself. So to on the other side, if the woman demands that the marriage go ahead, we give the husband time to support himself and to prepare. The how much time does he get? We look at what would be the case if he demanded her, how much time would she get? And we give him the same amount of time. If she would get 12 months, he gets 12 months. If she would get 30 days, he gets 30 days. Final halacha. If the time came, the woman demands the husband to get married. We say, okay, you got 30 days. 30 days pass, and he didn't actually marry her. From that day onwards, he is obligated to support her. Even if he didn't consummate the marriage. But if the date the end of 30 days, the end of the year, came out to be on a Sunday or on a Friday, when you cannot get married, he's not required to support her on that day, because he cannot marry her. Same thing if he got sick, or she got sick, or she became a nida, when the time came, and so the, the marriage cannot be consummated, he does not need to require, he's not required to support her for that time. Because anyways, she cannot get married until she becomes pure, until she becomes healthy. Neither can he consummate the marriage till he's healthy, and therefore, it isn't considered his fault. But once it does become his fault, then from that day on, if he doesn't consummate the marriage, he's obligated to provide her with support.